Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Today's program is part of our Mass General for Children Parenting Series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General for Children. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you are in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff, our co-host and guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'll be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. All right, so next I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Brianna Beckfold. She is the project manager and editor of Mass Channel for Children, and she'll introduce you all to today's guest speaker. All right, thank you, Amy. So welcome everyone to this session of the MGFC Parenting Series at Mass General Hospital for Children, where pediatric health experts share their knowledge on various pediatric health and family-related topics. This year, we're collaborating with the Blum Patient and Family Learning Center at Mass General. And today we have Julie O'Brien from the Lori Center for Autism here with us to present on decision-making decision options and protections for children who have intellectual and or developmental disabilities when they're approaching the age of 18 or the transition into young adulthood. She's going to share information and guidance on guardianship options and alternative protections, what guardianship is, the different types and pathways to guardianship, and how to prepare a guardianship. She'll also share resources and materials for legal experts in special needs. Please note that this session is not intended to be legal advice or counsel. It is strictly for informational and coaching purposes. So before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker. Julie O'Brien is a family support clinician at the Lori Center for Autism, where she provides information and, to, and support to families of children and adults with autism and other developmental, intellectual, and neurodevelopmental disabilities. She earned her master's in counseling from Springfield College. As Amy mentioned, at the end of the session, uh, Julie will be addressing questions. So if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box and we'll have time for them later. So from here, I will hand it over to our speaker. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Brianna. Thanks, Amy, for the uh, great introduction. I'm really, really happy and honored to be here. Um, I am uh, presenting my slides today, and I, um, yes, I am a family support clinician at Lurie Center, Mass General, or an ambulatory clinic out uh, in Lexington. We're not downtown at the hospital. Um, and real, um, so I'm going to go through some slides and talk to you about, um, you know, guardianship and uh, alternatives. And we'll talk about, I have some uh, objectives for the talk. We have about an hour or so, and I'm happy to answer questions as many as I can. Um, and just briefly, so uh, in my role as a professional, I do a lot of teaching and educating and coaching, particularly around transition age. Uh, so for our patients and their families, many of them, the majority of them stay with us at the Lurie Center. And so from early on, and maybe they're uh, diagnosed early as, as children, and then children grow up, our, all our kids grow up, don't they? So they become you know, adolescents, then young adults and adults. So my primary role, primary role at our multidisciplinary um, center here is to work with our uh, families of patients around 14 and older. And transition is a really important, I call them ages and stages, really important uh, time for learning. Just when you think you're sort of on the Tra trajectory and developmental stage where you can kind of cruise along and maybe school's going well and home services and things. Um, and then you got to learn about adult services. So it's sort of a deer in headlights uh, situation, but I'm here to help coach and guide and provide information and resources, kind of like a, a navigator, if you will, a GPS. I'm also the parent of three wonderful adult children, two on the autism spectrum um, and different ends of the spectrum. And uh, they both have guardianship. And so I know personally as well, uh, so because I've been through it. So I'm learning as I go and, um, and sharing as I go. 
grow in this journey um, that I share with many of you. So today, the agenda, um, I'm going to talk an overview and basic, con basic concepts of decision making and guardianship in particular, uh, alternatives to guardianship. Uh, they're lesser restrictive, as you'll learn. Um, this is, these are all legal uh, pieces of information and tasks. Um, and there are restrictive, more restrictive and less restrictive. And there's different paths to guardianship. That's my word. Um, there will be terms, terminology that I use throughout the talk that are legal terms that I've had to learn um, as well and become familiar with that parents often don't know because you don't do this every day. You don't know what you don't know. Um, and the powers and duties of a guardian or guardians. Um, so um, I will say, and I'm gonna uh, sort of uh, re reiterate what uh, Brianna said, um, this information is not intended to be legal advice or guidance. I feel like I've gone to law school by proxy because I've gone to different webinars myself and talks. I talk to attorneys in this field, uh, the special attorneys out there that, that focus on special needs law. Uh, we're very lucky in Massachusetts to have uh, those experts. Many of them are parents as well. So I'm not giving you any kind of legal advice. Uh, I also run workshops at the Lurie Center uh, on these topics for our patients because many are growing up, as I said, many parents need to know this information uh, and make sure that they are doing what's best for their children or child and themselves. So um, I just wanna make sure that uh, I, people uh, know that. I'm also, you know, I know we talked about this, but when I do my workshop, and this is the slides, these are the slides of the PowerPoint that I use in my workshops, I have to certainly respect HIPAA compliance. So um, we don't have to worry about patient privacy today because we don't have it open to, um, to questions. Um, but I am always I'm sort of the HIPAA uh, police around here, particularly because I work a lot with adults. Um, so we're always re uh, respecting privacy. Um, so uh, this slide is a little bit different um, and I am not the, the guru. Look at that, the middle individual and family that's supposed to say individual and family. Um, uh, I have my own sort of technical challenges with PowerPoints, but I think I, I did a pretty good job in this one and hopefully the information will be important. Uh, um, relayed and understood. So why am I showing you all these circles? Um, so my colleagues think I, I love circles. I always use circles sort of as a guide. Um, these wraparound supports and services are supposed to really uh, provide guidance on really it represents all the domains that are important to all of us in our lives, like housing, uh, transportation, uh, vocational employment, uh, medical, mental health, behavioral health care, right? So I use this um, as a sort of a, um, a, a vision or example of what we need to think of, particularly our parents and, and our uh, and patients that I work with ages 14 and older, to represent, to th think about some of the really important domains um, that we need to, in the circles and the information that's in those circles. And I ask them, what do you have in place and what's missing? And then we try to think about creating an action plan to get services and supports in place. So I'm going to focus on just these two circles over here. This is a very busy slide with a lot. Um, individual and families in the middle are our patients at the Lurie Center, your, your family and your children or child. And these folks go out to the very important aspects of life, domains that we, that we have to prioritize. And there's different ages and stages. This particular time, we're talking about guardianship and alternatives for decision-making when our children uh, become the age of majority or adults. And this particular circle, uh, legal financial decision making is the domain that I that I categorize um, turning 18 and making decisions. Um, so I bring this up when I talk about this because it's right next to the public benefits um, and uh, applying for uh, you know public benefits, state services, and things. And um, I often sort of equate the two. If somebody so guardianship and other alternatives, as you will hear, are legal entities. They're legal. Um, uh, documents and procedures uh, and steps. And so if, and people can do this on their own. Uh, parents often do this on their own, particularly with coaching and support, but you can go out and, and get an attorney. That's what they're there for. You can you know retain an attorney and have it done for you. Um, if people are going to do that, if parents, if you are thinking about going out and getting an attorney for guardianship, you also want to make sure that you have your financial planning, your legal planning and estate planning, and also, um, you know, learning about public benefits, you want to do it right. So I bring that slide up to say, you know, if you're going to go out 
excuse me, and focus on and get resources about, you know, guardianship or other other alternatives, you want to, you might as well just, you know, sort of have a package and, and uh, if you're going to consult with somebody, you get information about the other things, the financial planning, long term planning, estate planning, things like special needs trusts. So why are we talking about guardianship now? What happens when your child turns 18? The same thing as what happened when my children turned 18 several years ago, many, many moons ago. Um, they reach the age of majority or emancipation. And so that means that like any of us that turn 18, whether we have a diagnosis or a disability or, or um, you know, or not, we become emancipated. We, are, we become our own adults in the world, Massachusetts and certainly other states, and we can make our own decisions. Are we all ready to make decisions, um, good decisions? That may not necessarily be true. I'm not sure I make good decisions these days that I'm way past the age of 18. But um, it really means seriously for our kids who are, you know, uh, uh, need our support, some more than others, a range of supports and uh, for safety reasons and um, decision making around uh, many, many areas, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, we are no longer legally responsible. So some people may already know this and other people just don't. We don't, we don't really think about this. Um, some of us don't. So, you know, you're cruising along and life is busy, especially these past years with, you know, the pandemic and, um, you know, our kids are in school and they have doctor's appointments and we're busy with work and just multiple things on our plate and, and on our minds, we may not be thinking that, oh my gosh, my child is turning 18 and what does that mean? Unless you are talked about, unless you prepared and you talk about it, maybe a social worker or the primary care doctor, or maybe one of our specialists here at Lurie. My job is to help families learn about this ahead of time. And so you have time to plan. I, I never like, um, and I always say this to the, you know, the patients with whom I work or the parents, I never like to see deer in headlights, but I expect it. And my goal is to help ease that, and let it go down a little bit. And just, you know, some of the information I might share is, might increase the deer in headlights. We ultimately, the goal is for, for it to go away a little bit and, and, and get, you know, get the information that you need and really help you realize that it's gonna be okay. You can get through this time. Um, so it means that our kids are not able to make informed decisions or give consent. They're presumed competent, no matter if they have, and in my son's case, a cognitive intellectual disability. So cognitive impairment um, based on cognitive testing, uh, an IQ score of around 70 or below. He's also nonverbal, uh, expressive or receptively, and that uh, really is significant um, needs and needs 24 seven care. He was presumed competent when he turned 18 in the eyes of the law and in the world. So it's, um, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a, again, a deer in headlights moment, but parents, we have to learn early, the earlier the better to know this is coming so we can plan and make sure we have, uh, things in place, legal uh, things in place to make sure that we can continue to do what we do uh, and as we've done when they're minors. So even if your child or children have a developmental, neurodevelopmental condition, uh, intellectual impairment, autism spectrum disorder, uh, and co-occurring co mental health issues um, or uh, conditions, uh, it, they become emancipated. And uh, so they're you know, asked to sign uh, documents. They're considered legal adult, considered capable of making their own decisions and giving an informed consent and able to understand results of decisions. And that can be across areas in school, uh, at a medical appointment, dentist appointment, thinking about procedures, medical procedures, um, you know, applying for public benefits and services, understanding what you're doing and making decisions, signing documents, and having conversations, asking questions so that you can make informed decisions, access to bank accounts. So these are all changes that happen. Again, you may have children who are over the age of 18 um, already, and you know this, that um, you know if you don't have anything in place that your child is often asked uh, to make decisions and planning about the future, where they're gonna live, uh, signing legal contracts like you know, purchasing a car or getting a credit card, so there's a, a range of um, you know, uh, tasks and decisions and um, examples. So parents are no longer in the position, even though we think we are, and even though we always have been, um, and even though we know we need to be uh, to do that. 
this actually happened recently in two scenarios before I get to the alternative um, list of, of options that uh, are not guardianship. We had two different scenarios where patients of ours who, uh, because of the nature and extent of their, um, um, their diagnoses, uh, significant impairment cognitively. We had the testing to support that. Longtime patients here at Lurie, um, past the age of 18 for whatever reason, and um, two separate situations where their parent caregiver didn't know about guardianship and brought them to, again, separate situations, medical appointments. One to um, Boston Children's Hospital to have a procedure um, that this, this young man needed. Um, and the surgeon said that, you know, there's no way that um, I can uh, agree to that informed consent because of the, uh, the person's presentation. This, this patient was not able to do that. So the mom, uh, they wouldn't take the consent from the mother. So again, going back that down that road to how to figure out how to get guardianship or something in place so that could happen again. So, and somebody else said a dental uh, situation, it wasn't the dentist, but the anesthesiologist that uh, would not uh, accept the consent. So those, those are two medical. Um, so the, <clears throat> excuse me, this list is an alternative uh, or uh, lesser restrictive options, often um, considered a package, if you will. Now, again, I told you I'm not an attorney and I don't do this every day, but I have to know what these concepts are and explain to families, ex explain to parents to um, think about them. And I have a couple of slides to show you sort of uh, the spectrum of these options. So these are legal entities. Um, but not guardianship. And they cover, because we want to cover all the bases, all the ranges, all those domains as much as possible when we're thinking about protecting our children, protecting our young adults, and being involved and being able to advocate because that's what this is about. So medical health, typically you're going to hear about a healthcare proxy. You may know about a healthcare proxy because as an adult, maybe your uh, spouse is your healthcare proxy. It's an advanced directive that basically is a legal document for healthcare that is completed by you, a competent individual, and you're appointing somebody to be that, uh, that agent if there's a circumstance where you're not able to be that person to make the decision. So if you're in an accident, God forbid, or something happens, then your spouse or your trusted person that you appointed takes over. And uh, the goal is to have your wishes be, um, you know, be, be uh, listened to by the doctor and, and uh, whether, you know, around medical. Uh, a HIPAA release or um, consent, again, with HIPAA and privacy, uh, any medical place that you go, whether it's your child's primary care doctor or specialist here at Lurie, Mass General Brigham, emergency room and urgent care, wherever, you're gonna be asked, and I actually just printed one out today because I needed to give one to an adult uh, patient of ours coming in today who's emancipated, doesn't have any um, legal, or actually he's turning 18 next week, sorry. So he will turn 18 and I need him to sign this uh, so that I can continue to talk to his mom. Um, so that's a, an example of a HIPAA release. And then legal financial, you're gonna have an appointed advocate as an option, something called a durable power of attorney, you can look at custodial bank accounts, trustee for special needs trust. So that's a designated role responsibility. If you uh, develop a special needs trust, perhaps you've already done that um, in a rep payee. And that's a special uh, designated person, perhaps a parent, yourself, or somebody else to manage the social security benefits. Um, so again, these are all different documents, legal, that you would want a legal, you know, a, a specialist, an attorney to go over and review with you to make them your own, your child's own. Educational transfer of rights is another example. And so that is specific for uh, school. Um, and I'll talk about supported decision-making in a moment. So school between the ages of 17 and 18, real quick, your child, they know if your child's on an IEP um, that the child's turning, your young adult is turning 18. And the transfer of rights is a document that you guys can decide together as a team, parents and your young adult child, that either you got to do guardianship and then you tell the team and that's going to be the plan, or the transfer of rights is a document, um, let me go back, uh, transfer of rights under educational only, that you decide to determine together. Is your child going to have their own decision making and be their own, you know, adult signing their IEP or you know, deciding to obtain and accept their diploma? 
or are you going to do shared decision making, child and parent, young adult and parent after 18, or the, the child's going to designate and appoint the parent, if you will, to be uh, the decision maker. There's pros and cons to all those alternatives. Um, it doesn't require going to court. So I always tell families, again, because I'm not an attorney, I can't go into the nuances of the different ones or explain more than I already have. I just to know, I need to know what they are and then certainly refer families to legal um, you know, attorneys and people that know what those forms are to get more information. Cause that may be the choice that, that works for, for your situation and your young adult. Supported decision-making, again, a very important uh, topic that's becoming more known out in the world. Uh, not so much Massachusetts a couple of years ago, other states had this. It hasn't been legal in Massachusetts, but it's going to be. So it's on the horizon. And so this is an alternative to guardianship. And I think it's a wonderful alternative. I need to personally learn more about it to then share with families and parents as an option and our patients. It's, it's where the person, your person, your young adult identifies areas, you know, with the support of others, certainly, where they need assistance. And so that's, again, across the areas of medical employment, financial, where they live, and they choose their support team. So this involves the uh, acknowledgement and retainment of rights and autonomy. Um, so there's no court in involvement, and it means choice and ability. And so there's the, the, um, the uh, website, and you can certainly get more information about supported decision making. Many of the attorneys with whom I work and consult, and th those that I refer our families to, know about dis supported decision making, and it's wonderful. I think DDS, Department of Developmental Services, is the agency that you may already hear about that works very often with our adults and provides services and supports. They really like supported decision making. We just need to learn more about it. And if it, that's the right choice for your situation and your person, then that's wonderful for many reasons. All right, so right now, um, again, this is sort of a different way to look at it, a combination of legal and non-legal. So you've got your guardianship over here to my left, probably your left if you're looking at this, that requires going to court. And we're gonna get into that much more in detail um, in, a, in, a, in a moment. This is really about guardianship, right? So, and then the middle is no court, power of attorney, healthcare proxy, rep pay, and those other ones that I talked about. Those are in the middle. They, they don't require going to court, but they're legal. And then you wanna do them correctly. And then supportive decision-making right now in Massachusetts is not legal, but that's gonna get, that's gonna become. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so what is guardianship? So guardianship, and um, this is, I'm gonna talk specifically about Massachusetts guardianship, but guardianship is um, a concept, um, a legal, uh, concept in all states. And so, um, you know, this is not just a Massachusetts um, matter in our in our probate courts. Uh, so it is a court ordered legal protective arrangement. And so this is true if you go and hear an attorney speak about this, or if you go down to the probate court and ask a clerk um, about what guardianship is, you can look online, but this is what it is. This is um, sort of the definition, and it is a legal term. It's an arrangement for someone who has been considered incapacitated. Now, every time I see that word and say that word and hear myself say it, I really cringe. I don't like that word, but that is the legal term. It is in the laws, the Massachusetts laws. It might even be in the laws of other states. I don't know, um, you know, uh, I don't, I'm not really um, uh, educated in a lot about the other states, but incapacitated. And so, um, We'll go into that a little bit more um, later in terms of what's what's the definition of incapacitated, and then the guardian's decision making or gu guardian or guardians because there's more there can be more than one. That's often a question I uh, I'm asked um, if the guardian or guardians um, their decision making authority extends to areas only specified by the court or the judge, and so that's really important to know. It's not all or nothing, um, and it's not. Uh, control or micromanaging. This is about being in a protective situation uh, and uh, responsibility and role to be an advocate, to be, um, you know, an authority when it needs to be an authority to make decisions on behalf of the person only in the areas needed. So we're really talking about retaining rights and autonomy 
at with his support, but being in a legal role um, and um, having that, you know, having that appointment by the court. So, and again, exercising only amount of authority necessary and that's least restrictive. So that's coming right down from Massachusetts, uh, the probate court. And then there's different types of guardianships. Um, there and so this can be a little bit confusing, but I have a really good way to to um, to explain and educate people. Took me a while to to grasp this too. So a limited guardianship um, in Massachusetts or a guardianship with limitations is preferred. And so I want to explain to you what that what that is. And so I'm gonna um, go to a different. Um, if I can do that. Go to a different, all right. So before I do that, I wanna to go to a different slide. I apologize. Um, guardianship basics. So I'm gonna, hopefully you guys can see all this. I'm gonna newly share uh, guardianship basics. So I have to give kudos in, and, um, you know, acknowledgement to those uh, resources that I share. So this, I didn't create this chapter. This chapter is from um, attorney Barbara Jackins book, a, an initial version of uh, her book, which I have right in front of me, Legal Planning for Special Needs in Massachusetts. Legal Planning for Special Needs in Massachusetts, attorney Barbara Jackins. So the version that is the most recent, I don't think you can even get it anymore, um, her third version. This chapter is from her second version, but I use it because it's a wonderful, user-friendly, really um, wonderful way to describe uh, what guardianship is, what it isn't, and to look at the scope of guardianship. So I'm gonna talk to you about limited guardianship versus general guardianship. And so in Massachusetts, Again, it's a court-ordered arrangement. You have to go to court, you present information, and a judge at the end of the day has to determine that your person is found incapacitated based on the standard, meaning a standard. But you do not want to give up your, you know, nobody wants to give up rights if they don't have to. So there's um, sort of tiers of guardianship, the way I describe it. And the tiers are, well, there can be a limited guardianship, which is really only one or two specific areas. So think about a scenario uh, where that might be okay and appropriate. So maybe it's someone who um, only needs uh, real involvement, support, and someone to be appointed to be their medical or healthcare guardian. So I'm not talking about healthcare proxy, I'm talking about guardian to be in that role. That means giving medical consent for most everyday medical decisions, like uh, going to appointments and getting medical care for annual physicals and making decisions around um, treatment uh, for um, you know medication, uh, certainly COVID, getting vaccinated, things like that. And so there are some limitations with that medical, but that's an example of limited. Sometimes limited can be medical and legal, but that means if it's limited, the person retains all the other rights. To, and so uh, a general guardianship is broad control around major areas. So if broad control in comparison versus limited, it's major areas like, and I'm gonna scroll down, medical, health, and these are some of the examples of the decisions um, and some of the uh, requirements that, are, that we all need to make, but we're thinking about our kids seeking medical care when they're sick, weighing risks and benefits of particular procedures, understanding the need for routine care, um, things like that, and weighing, again, risks and benefits. So we talked about medical, educational, grasping the essentials. Why am I on an IEP? Do I need to be on an IEP? Can I consent to the assessments that are required and placements and whether to take a diploma or not or to you know, uh, attend post-secondary services and support? So there's a lot of decisions around the educational realm, particularly for our kids who have special education needs. Um, and you know, throughout the years in Massachusetts until 22 in other states too. Financial, we're not talking about a lot of money and assets. That's a different type of guardianship, but guardianship of, you know, understanding money basics, small amounts of money, um, particularly when our, if our kid, our, our children are uh, vulnerable for exploitation. Um, and then vocational adult services understanding what these services are and how they can help us and how they can assist us for our children in the adult, their adult life 
applying for them, signing documents, signing consents for assessments or considerations for packets to be sent out to programs and working with DDS um, and their vendor agencies. So that's a, that's a big decision sort of realm in and of itself. Um, living arrangements, legal, self-care and safety and communication. So there, is a, there are a lot of domains. If, so I'm gonna scroll back up really quickly and again, tell you that general guardianship, a general scope of guardianship, which is also called um, uh, full and plenary, you'll hear those three and they're synonymous, plenary, full or general, that guardianship would entail all of those areas. Whereas a limited guardianship would only entail one or two. And again, this is not for everybody, your situation with your child or children, it, well, it depends. You need to figure that out and think about it um, if you're thinking about guardianship. Um, now in, um, sorry, I'm gonna go to a different slide here. Again, in Massachusetts, it gets a little bit more uh, not confusing, but yeah, confusing. But actually I like, I like this piece. So you can have limitations to a guardianship. And again, I know that this, this is the part of the, the talk and the discussion uh, with parents that sort of makes their deer in headlights uh, get uh, a little bigger because, wait, you just told me there's full guardianship and then you just told me there's limited, but what's this limitations? Is that the same? Is that different? How does that come into play? Well, um, this is a list uh, that can be um, considered for your your adult, your individual, even with a guardianship that's that's full and broad, but these um, acknowledgements, these rights, retaining these rights, you look at this. This is sort of everyday activities, you know, and these are rights decisions that are that many of our individuals can retain, so they should be acknowledged. And this list can be considered when you get to the point of really thinking about a guardianship and that's gonna be the right way to go, can my son or daughter, or can they retain the right to bathe, dress, toilet with assistance? You know, can they write to determine, do they have the right and can they make choose their own meals? Um, what about living arrangements, maintaining their own home? What about being alone? So there's a, there's a bunch of different options here that gets really specific using public transportation independently or with support. So the right to vote. What a wonderful, I mean, that's an inalienable right. Everybody has the right to vote, actually, even with, with support uh, and help. So um, that should be on here as well. And so this may not be for everybody, but is something that really um, our, and I want to make sure parents know this, and when they get to the point where they're talking with professionals about the question of guardianship and the scope of guardianship, can this be embedded in part of the guardianship so that, again, these rights are retained, the guardian has a certain authority in certain areas, even if it's broad in the major areas, but then this allows our children, our young adults to maintain rights, and so the guardian can't micromanage or for control. So that's really important, and I hope that that um, makes sense to people. Um, I'm going to go back to the slide and um, certainly I'll, I'll answer questions about this. Um, okay, back to the slide. Hopefully everybody can see this. All right, let's move on a little bit. Um, what is guardianship? It's a legal process. You have to file paperwork, a lot of documents, in fact, in the probate and family court uh, that is um is in your county where your child lives. So if you live and your child lives with you, it's in your county. So when I, my, my kids, we were living in Dedham and they happened to have been in Norfolk County. And so that was the probate and family court that we had to go and interact with. And we still um, have that relationship. So even if you end up moving, for the most part, again, it's my experience and as you know, I'm not an attorney, your guardianship stays with the probate court, even if your child moves. Your child could move into a residential group home or you could move somewhere else in Massachusetts. Uh, it's a different situation if you move out of state, but I'm not gonna go into that uh, uh, in this, in this um, presentation. A judge approves and assigns. 
uh, the, the guardians or co-guardians. So it is a judge. Um, it is a hearing. Um, and, um, you know, it's a very serious, you know, um, uh, process. Um, guardians make all or some decisions in major areas. Again, I just can't you know, drive that home enough. Uh, and it can mean removal of some or all rights to make decisions of, you know, of your young adults. So that's important. Again, my goal here is to make sure parents and professionals that work in this field really know so you can um, understand this concept, understand and figure out, is this gonna be the right thing for you? The right, uh, the right um, you know, what's best to, for your child or the patient with whom you work. Um, what is the legal standard for an incapacitated person? Well, the person has a clinically diagnosed condition, uh, is unable to receive and evaluate information or communicate decisions. And this is sort of bullet pointing um, and lacks the ability to meet essential requirements for physical health, safety, or self-care, even with appropriate technological assistance. So these are the main uh, important pieces for um, a judge to uh, find a, some, someone um, incapacitated. And that's the stand, that's what a judge needs to do to then um, find them to be under guardianship for lack of a better explanation. So, um, so these, this is important for parents to know if you're gonna pursue guardianship, you do have to realize that you're going in front of a judge to have a judge determine this about your child based on clinical information that's presented. Um, all right, we'll talk a little bit more about that later in terms of how to do that. Because again, parents are thinking, you're probably thinking, how, how does that happen? Do I send them a neuropsych? Do I have to, you know, how do, how do we do that? What's the process? A few, um, I would, this is one slide. I want to talk to you about types of guardianships and I'm, I am keeping track of the time because I want people to be able to ask me questions. There are many types of guardianships in Massachusetts, maybe other, other states too. One is important to know that if in the event there's an emergency situation, and this hopefully doesn't, it doesn't come up that often, but if somebody is over the age of 18, there's no guardianship in place, and perhaps for whatever reason, maybe there's a hearing scheduled, um, but COVID has really caused a backlog in the courts and the hearing hasn't been scheduled yet. And there's an emergency situation for a medical procedure where the person is just not able to give consent. That might be a situation where a parent with their attorney or on their own has to seek an emergency guardianship uh, hearing. And it's time limited. So uh, what I explain to parents is that buys you time to get that emergency, you know, to be appointed to be able to consent to an emergency uh, situation like a medical procedure, um, and then you proceed with the um, the long-term permanent guardianship later. Um, I already talked to you about the limited, um, full, plenary, or general. Um, and there is, at the end of the day, when you get to court, there is something called the decree and order of an appointment. That's a the document, the legal document that the judge uh, signs and you get, or you and the co-guardian or, or whoever's the guardians. And on that page, there is a list of limitations that you would have already determined and decided and all agreed upon that's actually on the decree. So those limitations become part of the order, which is, I think it really important for people to know. Conservatorship in Massachusetts is different than California. I know California is a different, you know, especially with the, um, you know, uh, things that happened last year with the conservatorship. It's a very different um, uh, meaning in mass. Conservatorship in mass or conservatorship is for legal and financial affairs only. So it's, um, again, not, Often for our, our kids, our, our you know, young adults, if we've planned appropriately um, and they haven't received a windfall lottery, uh, but maybe you know, hopefully they have a special needs trust, able account, or they're getting um, SSI. So uh, conservatorship is rare in my experience uh, for our, our patients because um, they don't need it. Whereas guardianship is of the person. Um, Rogers authority. So this is interesting. Rogers is a special law. It's a special above and beyond authority that's above and beyond the regular guardianship that I talked about. When somebody um, under the medical realm and health is being prescribed an antipsychotic medication or in being prescribed another extraordinary treatment. 
So it goes above and beyond. It requires a special authority in order. And so ECT treatment is one of those um, treatments and uh, antipsychotic medication. And so I bring those up because here at Lurie, many of our doctors are psychiatrists. Many of our patients, including my son, has uh, medication that's an antipsychotic medication that he needs and he'll need it. Um, very well researched and treats certain symptoms of mood and uh, mood lability and aggression and agitation that, that just he needs it. So we had needed to go and seek a Rogers authority. So that's a special uh, guardianship for somebody who's already under a guardianship, including medical. So it just, it's sort of a, an asterisk where if somebody, if your child is being prescribed or if you're going to seek guardianship and petition, if they have that medicine as a prescription at the time for ECT treatment, then you're gonna to need to pursue the Rogers. And I often tell families, parents that um, because of the nature of the process and the amount of documentation and paperwork, it's pretty cumbersome and confusing. I recommend um, talking to an attorney, their own attorney to help them. Um, so again, this is the limitations of the guardian. I already talked about that. You can, so, But you can't, this is actually an important one. You can't admit or commit your person to a mental health facility under guardianship. That's a confusing um, uh, piece of information because oftentimes parents will think, well, I'm, I'm my son's guardian and he's in an emergency room and I want to sign him into a psychiatric unit because he has symptoms that warrant that and he needs that level of care. Um, that can't happen. And um, so I, I don't want to go into that too much. I'm not an expert in that, but I just know that it, it's above and beyond a, a guardianship. And, and, and that's where I would say, you know, you want to talk to an attorney or the hospital's uh, legal people or DDS if DDS is involved or DMH. Um, you can't admit to a nursing facility. So again, these are limitations to a guardianship. So it's not this you know, free for all, I can make all these decisions. Um, there, there's limitations in Massachusetts court um, and in the law. And then we talked about the Rogers, which is called a substitute judgment. Uh, my goal here is that I'm bringing this information to you. And if you need to get more information about these concepts and these, these options um, that you go and, and, and do so with the resources I provide. Um, so duties and responsibilities, of, of course, acting in the best interest of your person, um, you have to report. So when someone is a guardian or guardians, you are entering into a relationship with the court. And so when you enter into this relationship, the court, the judge doesn't say, okay, here's your decree, here's your order, good luck, you know, good luck to you in your life and your child's life. You are in a relationship and you need to report. And initially people will say, wait a minute, what do you mean by report? I don't know what that means. Well, there's a care plan and there's again, paperwork, there's a procedure for this. The initial 60 days after the hearing, so two months, 60 days, you have to report. And then annually on the hearing date. And there's a, there's a form, you don't have to make it up. There's an annual care plan. And so parents really, again, that's where that urine headlights come up again a little bit. You wanna know what you're getting into. And some people really, you know, are not happy with that, but um, they, they, they want you to report. You have to, and, and, and that's a requirement. They wanna know how your child's doing or, or your adult. And so there's definitely information on those forms that you need to, um, you know, include and provide, um, and they read them. Um, so change of address and termination of a guardian or person. So it's this business-like relationship, believe it or not, even though you're a parent and you would do these things anyway, um, again, that's sort of a tip that you're entering into, into a business relationship with the court, the probate court, and you need to, you know, keep that and follow the rules and um, follow, you know, make sure you fulfill the responsibilities. When and how do, how do I begin? A lot of parents ask me. And so usually one or two years before the child's birthday, do children turn 18? Our kids here turn 18 every day. Um, you know, we've got this guy next week turning 18 and um, it happens. And so that's a wonderful, uh, you know, milestone and you should celebrate it. But if you know, or even are thinking about 
uh, your young adult, soon to be 18 year old, thinking if you they need a guardianship or an alternative, you really should start a couple of years before. Think about it, know what's coming, know what your options are. If you haven't had uh, for your child a cognitive adaptive functioning assessment, so we're talking about um, in school, every three years as part of the IEP process, they get cognitive um, or psychological testing. So you'd get the IQ as part of that, full scale, most of the time full-scale IQ, um, adaptive functioning assessments. This can also be a neuropsych evaluation, which a neuropsych evaluation can be very useful and helpful uh, to inform many tasks, turning 18 tasks, like applying for eligibility and applying for benefits, but it can be informative to guardianship. Uh, carefully consider strengths, needs, vulnerabilities. Certainly, we're always doing that all the time. Talk to professionals who know your child best. Some of our adults who are considered high cognitively uh, verbal, maybe former Asperger's syndrome, that profile, we're not sure. Many parents aren't sure. Do I do this? Do I not? That's not an easy decision, even with, with that your young adult. That's why you have to pull in others. Um, schedule a guardianship evaluation. So that guardianship evaluation, I'll talk about in a minute. What is a guardianship evaluation? I thought you just said I needed a neuropsych evaluation. Um, so I'll talk about that. And, and then I'm, I'm definitely going to leave some, some space and some time for questions. The AFC program, really quickly, why am I bringing this up? It has nothing to do with guardianship. It's a mass health program. So it's offered through mass health for your child not yourself, but for your adult child. It's not PCA, personal care attendant, but it's like that. It's when your child needs assistance with these activities of daily living, even a little bit of assistance or prompting to full assistance or dependence. This program is a caregiver program that MassHealth through a vendor agency in Massachusetts pays a caregiver, um, but the, and it's a tax-free stipend for being the caregiver. But I bring it up now because the parent can be the caregiver. Naturally, they live with the person and they can be the caregiver under this program. You can look it up and, and learn, learn more about it here, but they can't be the legal guardian. So that's a real stickler for parents who are single parents and uh, for other situations. Nobody wants to not be included on a guardianship or give it up. But um, so finally, and again, I know I this is, a lot to talk about. The path to guardianship in Massachusetts, it's one or the other, it's not both. And so this guardianship evaluation that the court needs, this is a document that, that after the guardianship evaluation, it gets filled out, the court needs it to determine, you know, the, the meeting the standard uh, for incapacity and therefore having a guardian or guardians. It's one or the other, it's medical certificate or clinical team report. So you may or may not have heard this. The medical certificate path is for an individual <clears throat> that's gonna be you know, considered for guardianship who does not have an intellectual disability by definition. A clinical team report is required for someone who does. They can still have autism spectrum disorder or another neurological or neurodevelopmental condition, co-occurring mental illness. But the key is, do they have an intellectual disability? Uh, having an IQ of around 70 or below and adaptive skill uh, functioning impairment. So that's, there's a definition there. Um, so someone who does not requires a medical certificate, somebody who does a clinical team report. And there's a difference in timeline uh, for when these are needed and a difference in who does these about. So a medical certificate is completed by one licensed clinician versus the clinical team report is three licensed professionals and it's a licensed psychologist, licensed social worker um, and licensed MD. Um, and then there's a whole process when you get to the court of filing paperwork. So I am gonna stop because I uh, there's these favorite resources I have um, that I definitely wanna share, but um, I I'd love to answer some questions and um, yeah, open it up for uh, Brianna and Amy. Great, thank you so much, Julie. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. Um, someone is asking if we can repost in the chat the previous Massachusetts website. Um, 
Sure. Massachusetts, which um, for the guardianship? Uh, it doesn't uh, specify, hopefully. Previous websites. Hopefully oh, would that be Mass response. for the AFC program? So that's the AFC program. Um, yep, that was it. Awesome. So that's okay. the adult family care. Great. And you'll be able to see the information, the requirements, the different levels, and the agencies. So there are vendor agencies that provide the program. Mass Health is the state agency that funds it you know, through Medicaid, and then uh, the AFC providers are vendor agencies. So you'll see all those agencies. And they go to your house, by the way. So you could live, you know, like I lived in Dedham and we did the program and we went through Miniman Arc and they were in Concord. So don't feel like you have to stick with a catchment area. And I think they they pretty much serve broad, broad areas. Um, and a lot of the agencies do a really good job. Okay, excellent. Um, our next question is, what happens when a parent or other caregiver has guardianship and they pass away? Who steps in if that were to happen? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. And uh, that's a terrible situation. So if guardian, that happens. If a guardian passes away, uh, that guardianship, you know, ends and um, the court needs to be told. And so if that leaves no guardian, then that's a significant, you know, concern and risk. So um, one thing I would definitely say is, you know, uh, try to work with an attorney um, to try to get a, a, an emergency guardianship in place. Uh, and then, then that buys you time to go back and do a, um, a uh, you know, permanent guardianship. So if, what, if it's one guardian and they pass away, somebody else has to go through the same um, procedure. So that means, I'm going back. So that means filling out documentation. The court is not, the, the probate court will not appoint a guardian, um, even if it's um, recommended in somebody's living will, you know, a successor guardian. It's a process and I'm just the messenger. The good news is if there is a living will, and this is part of, you know, important planning, if a guardian parent say has a living will and says something happens to me, I wish X, Y, Z to be my successor guardian for my child. If it's written there, that's a determined to be a priority in the court. I do know that. And so that's sort of a, a nominated you know, person. So they will prioritize in the court, but you just can't run to court and say, this person died, can you appoint me? Unfortunately, so you have to go through it. But um, Again, that yeah, that would be a situation where um, the, an attorney could help you. The other thing is a co. All right, so if it's, there's a co-guardian or even three guardians, if a guardian passes away, the other two remain or one remains on the guardianship. So oftentimes, in Barbara Jackins and other Karen Mariscal and all these other attorneys with whom I work and, and receive coaching from, there, um, there's others. There's plenty of others that I that I love that I work with, but they'll say. Um, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, in planning, right? When you're doing the guardianship at say it's at 18 and you're thinking about the future because we always are, think about an older sibling of your, of your child, like an older brother or sister and have them be placed on the guardianship as a co if that works for them and your family. That, but that means later on, they're already on there and you don't have to go back and go through the process. So it's, it's thinking about the future as we always are and um, just, you know, making sure that they don't have to do this process again um, if something emergency happens. Great. Thank you. Great question. Um, our, and we have about four or five minutes left. Um, our next question is, are there any major differences in guardianship from Massachusetts to other New England states? And where can you learn more about guardianship in New England, varying by state? Great question. I would go to each state's website, you know, Google a guardianship of an adult. You can use the word incapacitated. That is, unfortunately, I'm kind of finding that there's other states um, that use that. Um, I know a little bit about New Hampshire and Rhode Island. I don't know about Vermont, but every state has guardianship of adult um, information, especially these days uh, on the websites. And they'll require documentation. 
and some might have booklets um, to you know download. We do have some patients here at Lurie that live out of state, so I don't know the answers like I do for Massachusetts. I have to be honest, and I apologize, but there are certainly um, information sources. I don't know if there's a there's not one website that I know of. Um, yeah, um, but you know Massachusetts is very specific and updated the laws in 2009 to require all these different, um, you know, the limitations and things like that. So it is um, unique. Okay, excellent. Um, our next question is, uh, if someone is a permanent legal, uh, excuse me, a permanent guardian, can that be legally changed? Yeah, so my short answer is, and I've learned um, that anything can be changed but you have to go back to the court and request it. So you can fill out a petition to um, have someone step down or it's, it's either a motion or a petition, I forget. Um, so someone can step down or be relinquished from the guardianship and somebody else can be appointed. But again, everything is a process and requires a document and steps with the court. Okay. Great question. Thank and you. sometimes filing fees. So it's not free. I kind of want to say that, you know, it's not hundreds of dollars, but they might charge you filing fees, uh, $15, $30, something like that. So there's all, again, the, the, and I'm learning every day that maybe a court in Plymouth County will charge somebody, but then somebody in Worcester may not. It's very variable across the probate courts. You would think that it would be all universal, but Okay, and great. that's a great way to find out. You could call your county probate court or go online um, or they have attorneys of the day and sometimes they have clinics. It varies by probate court, but they're there to help too. Okay, excellent. That uh, leads into our next question very nicely. Um, if someone has uh, some financial challenges and they are unable to afford an attorney, are there pro bono attorneys who can uh, great, support them in these situations? A great question. That's why I wish I went to law school and I would be that pro bono attorney. Um, well, so uh, that's why I do my workshops. Um, they're open to anybody. And again, just like I said here, every day, all day, I'm not legal advice. I can't give you legal advice, but I can coach you through it. So I do offer the workshops here at Lurie. But um, uh, there are some pro bono um, opportunities. Um, trying to think. The VLP Volunteer Lawyers Project is one. Um, I don't know if it's on here. So some of the courts will have clinics, Essex does, Suffolk, um, and Middlesex County offer clinics. I believe you have to prove your financial hardship, but um, I would definitely look into those volunteer lawyer projects. Um, and there may be some others that the particular courts have, um, but my workshops also are open to anybody. And there's um, they are at the um, Lurie website, and I should have had the, the link on here, I apologize, but those are open. There's a small fee for each of them, or we offer financial hardship as well, um, but we don't do the guardianship evaluations for non-Lurie patients, but the workshops are open. I'm happy okay. to help coach people through. Great. Uh, we have one last question. I think uh, then we can wrap it up. Um, regarding the option of a release in lieu of guardianship, um, this person has found that this is not accepted in a medical setting if the patient has an intellectual disability because they don't have the capacity to give consent. So it doesn't have the capacity to turn over consent. Would this be a good situation for an emergency or temporary guardianship? That's a great point. Um, I think depending on the medical setting, um, signing a release. So, you know, my, for example, if my son didn't have guardianship, first of all, we would have to help him sign it because he can't uh, write his own name. Um, so that, yeah, that's a concern. That's a, that's a concern for, you know, giving consent for someone to communicate which is and share information, right? Which, and be involved, parent to be involved with the care, which is different from giving informed consent to a procedure. Either way, yeah, if the 
medical facility, clinic, doctor doesn't accept it, then you're in trouble. That's a problem. So yes, that might definitely be, I can't say for sure, because again, I, I don't serve in this capacity. I don't go to the courts every day, but that would definitely mean, you know, um, if you are, um, if your child is not able to get care, appropriate care, medical care, um, and that's, you know, causing the problem because he, he or she or they can, you know, consent to the communication that may very well be considered an emergency for a temporary. Um, every court's different, but that, again, that would warrant an attorney to help um, make, because there's a lot of, even it's my understanding that to request an emergency guardianship, you have to put a motion in, which is a legal doc, uh, you know, uh, request, certain mm -hmm. doc, document to give the reasons why. Um, Excellent. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, yeah, that is our last question. So from here, we can uh, wrap it up. I'll have this is great. Up. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to me. Um, you know, I'm happy to help. This is what I do. I want to be sort of a beacon and, you know, <laughs> this is my last slide. Actually, I have a better slide. The last one is this, being led in the right direction is priceless. So I want to be that beacon of, uh, you know, providing information and, and hope and, and um, help you guys navigate your way. Thank you so much for your time, Julie. As I had mentioned, today's session is being recorded. So if you're interested in being in the recording, it'll be made available on the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. I also include that link in the chat if you're interested. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day. Stay well. Happy holidays. Thanks. Bye.